All right, this is Rebecca Roth, and just a quick introduction. I'm continuing on uh, to share with you a 10-part 9-11 program that I did over the Christmas holiday last year, 2018. So you're going to, I'm going to put two of these uh, programs together. These were for the uh, Behind the Galley Curtain membership site. And lots of people wanted to have them shared. So what I'm going to do is put two of them there around 30 minutes each. So you're going to hear some pausing as these two uh, videos connect together. Uh, but there will be two. It'll go on for about an hour. And... Um, what what we what I did was just kind of go in deeper to the discussion of 9/11 from inside the airline, so you can understand what I was looking at and what I was seeing as I uh, continued uh, to investigate uh, the events of 9/11. And then also, as a different aviation experts joined my uh, research team, because there were lots of people across the country that were in uh, several different airlines that were in several different uh, jobs as a flight attendant or a pilot had uh, experiences on that day or leading up to that day or shortly thereafter. And so I'll share, you know, some of those kind of things with you as well. All of that information then, as it came to me, was wrapped up into my novel series. There's four books in the methodical series now, Methodical Illusion, which came out in the late uh, 2014, Methodical Deception, uh, came out in 2015, Methodical Conclusion 2016, and then uh, last year, Methodical Exposure uh, that came out. That's book four. They're all available, uh, autographed from my online book site. So you can go to any one of those titles, a dot com. You can see the information in the description box uh, if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and so each book has a dot com, methodicalillusion.com, methodicaldeception.com, etc. You can order the books on Amazon in uh, book form, hardback, softback, or Kindle. Uh, you can also order them from your local library. They'll, they can get them and bring them in, or you can order them from Barnes & Noble or any good bookstore. You can get the ISBN numbers and the information uh, right off Amazon and then just go order it uh, from any bookstore. All right, so what happened to me then, I did a Coast to Coast AM uh, after uh, the first book had been out for a few months, and that literally brought in millions of people with little bits of information. I became a repository of information for people that uh, maybe didn't realize what was going on until they understood what, what had really happened. I heard, I heard an interview, for example. So then as all that information continued to come into me, I'm, I just kept writing the uh, methodical series using the protagonist, Vera Hansen, who I am not, uh, just to, uh, characters. So it's easier for you to digest what happened, I think, if you read, or watch it in a movie or read it in a book. And then um, uh, for those of you who are asking, yes, I'm working on book five in the series. I don't have a title yet for it. Uh, and then I'm also working uh, hand in hand at the same time with a nonfiction so that you can really understand what really did happen. And I think you're going to be able to see that it's going hand in hand with what is about to be exposed by our intelligence community with the Russia hoax claiming that Donald Trump was a Russian agent, etc., and how that hoax ha it parallels 9-11. And no, they're not going to want that book to come out. So <laughs> as a consequence, I have hit the road and um, am just keeping myself as mobile as possible. Yes, my website, BehindTheGalleyCurtain.com, is still under attack by Google. Uh, why do you suppose that four novels, uh, soon to be five and a nonfiction by a flight attendant is so threatening to Google? Uh, isn't it amazing? But um, I'm not a fishing site. If you come and join, it's like $4 a month. And um, I do a daily show. And you just never know what's going to trigger me to start talking about the current news that's going on, like the hoax and uh, the exposure I think that you're about to see. Um, of some of the people involved. Now, a lot of the people involved in the Russian hoax, the coup d'etat against Donald Trump, which is still ongoing, were also involved in Iran-Contra 
and um, the whole 9-11 kerfluffle, <laughs> the cover up or the planning and uh, perpetration of that. And so you can really you'll be able to see the the uh, correlation and, and how everything is kind of fit together. So um, for for those of you who are listening on YouTube, YouTube's already canceled my um, two and a half years of my page. Uh, I think they did that actually when I uh, did a program uh, that showed a screenshot of inside the Freedom of Information Act data showing you how uh, some of the uh, faked data about 9-11 was uploaded into the FAA headquarters in D.C., computer and time stamped when it was uploaded before the first aircraft pushed back from the gate on 9-11. So you can find me on Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com slash Rebecca Roth. Um, it might be Rebecca Roth show actually, but you'll be able to find it. Vimeo dot com uh, slash Rebecca Roth. I think we're still on iTunes and it's on SoundCloud. Uh, so you can uh, find us there. I, I just expect uh, YouTube to, again, cancel this at any moment. So I don't really <laughs> propose that you continue following only on YouTube. Maybe uh, just if you want audio so that you can download for the Saturday shows, uh, Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R dot com slash Rebecca Roth show. Uh, you can download them. So if you want to listen to it on your iPad or on your whatever. Uh, and as an MP3, you can do that. So, okay, now here's what I'm going to do this week is going to be um, part, this is what I was in deeper inside 9-11, um, the holiday special that I did in lieu of the daily show last Christmas uh, for about 10 days. And this is going to be part uh, three and four. And so again, you're going to hear some pauses as these videos connect together. So it'll be on, going on for probably roughly an hour. And again, if you haven't joined, if you're interested in 9-11 and you want to know more about the uh, inside track. Now this just to touch on basis, one of the things that happened to me when my first book came out and it got a lot of attention because Coast to Coast AM has a huge audience. And there were a lot of people that wanted to know about what did we think, those of us in the airline. And I was attacked for never being a flight attendant by uh, supposed 9-11 truthers. But a lot of them are going to be exposed. So you'll understand why my airline career was such a threat uh, to people that don't understand what the BTS is or any of the FAA protocols. And if they did, they'd know a lot more than they do, but they don't. And so I find that it was really fascinating because I'm not only being attacked by so-called 9-11 truthers that don't know anything about inside the airline that like to convince people that I never flew uh, <laughs> to, uh, and I think this will kind of help you understand that in fact I did fly uh, because this is really 9-11 in deeper inside from an airline perspective. Now I have become very good friends with some very senior uh, United and American flight attendants that were uh, some of them knew uh, some of the crew members and that have come forward and have shared um, in lots of inside information about um, both their airlines, how, how everything coincided with all the other airlines. So it's um, been a fascinating uh, journey. Um, I hope to have these next two books out um, sometime this year. I've just got lots of things going on and, and uh, the nonfiction is going to be a much bigger project than I initially thought. So um, I'll just project it out sometime this year. And uh, without further ado, I am going to move right along with this introduction and um, bring you part three and part four of Deeper Inside 9-11 from BehindTheGalleyCurtain.com. All right. Well, part three of the, I have this file on my computer. I call it Christmas Vacation. <laughs> but as a deeper dive into 9-11. So we're going to continue on and um, talk about what happens after? Now, what I wanted to do on the the beginning part of 9-11 was really explain how long some th things take, like information about who the crew was, who the passengers were, and why does why does that fit in? Now, if you look at, at everything you learn about, about the airline life at Vera and Grace, um, then you can kind of start to see, if you compare it to 9-11, how odd it was that um, the passengers and crew information uh, was released to the media by somebody, probably not the airline, uh, way too early. And so that was kind of one of the things I wanted to show you was the frustration 
uh, if there's an incident, and in, in this case, uh, the Vegas uh, crash into a hotel, not only did it involve the fictitious first lady, but also it involved the airline, the company that Vera worked for and Grace. So they were real concerned, and it's very frustrating to um, not be able to get access to who was the crew, who was on board. Although, um, if uh, if you're in contact with um, a terminal at an airport, as n uh, nowadays you can probably access this through a company's intranet. But at that time, most of the companies, uh, you had to be at a company computer uh, for a ticket agent, a reservation agent. But we could still use them, pilots, flight attendants, ground people. We could still find out if there were empty seats on board by pulling up the uh, passenger manifest list or the booking list to see how the flight was, if it was full or empty. Lots of interesting things have come out uh, from people... Um, concerning the four flights on 9-11 that were flight attendants trying to pass ride. I think this is mentioned in um, the fourth book. And they were denied passage for a weight and balance problem. That doesn't happen in, uh, on a jumbo jet unless uh, the plane is really, really full, oversold, full of cargo, full of mail, full of everything, full of passengers, full of fuel, and a real hot runway, like leaving Phoenix. I mean... In the middle of summer so um or hong kong maybe but uh it was very odd 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 and again we have those people had um, printed out manifests of who was really there and they were waiting to get on because they wanted to go visit friends from you know a to b maybe they were based in boston and they wanted to go to la to you know, go to an opening or a premiere or visit a friend or family, go to a wedding, whatever. And so they were trying to pass right and they were denied boarding. Uh, and the apparently the company uh, through operations in Dallas, Fort Worth uh, on American uh, had put out a, a message to deny all pass riding flight attendants. Regardless, they had nearly 100 empty seats. When do you think that uh, notice went out? I guess it can't, uh, it's hard to say. Um, usually that decision isn't made until the weight is figured out. So it's, it has to do with the weight of the plane, the passengers, the fuel, the cargo, and the temperature outside and the length of the runway. So it, it, it's... But, but in it, this particular case, I mean, it was pretty obvious that the weight was, wasn't going to be right. very heavy. And Boston in the summertime, I mean, it can't get a little hot, but it doesn't... Get not at eight in the morning. To, not at no. close to Phoenix. Not at eight in the morning. No. So uh, yet, yet it went out before the plane took off, obviously, and before the people were able to get on the pass. But and they would have probably pitched a fit about it, except for the fact they, the planes crashed, and so they weren't going to say anything about well, it. Well, again, people that were denied boarding because of weight imbalance, flight attendants that tried to pass ride, and I've been contacted by people from both airlines that were denied boarding as flight attendants, pass riding. Uh, so I don't, I, I have no idea who, where it came from or when that decision was made. What I'm trying to say is that that decision isn't made until the people basically are on the plane, have boarded, the fuel's put on, air, they look at how much cargo, how much luggage, and all of that's done through uh, operations dispatch area, main uh, uh, load factor center, load center, where that decision then would be made that says, oh, well, we, but, but that wouldn't happen if you had 80 seats open or 90 seats open, empty. Uh, that would only happen if the, the flights was completely full and extremely heavy with cargo or mail, you know, like maybe right before Christmas packages and stuff. But, but uh, even then it's, the temperature, it's just unheard of, actually. Okay, but knowing what you know now, why wouldn't the airline want extra flight attendants on board? Well, because they would have reacted uh, to the faked hijacking and done the right thing and tried to figure out what the hell was going on. And they knew the protocol, they knew the steps to follow, and obviously none of the crew members were following those steps. That's been proven to us over and over. And that's one of the red flags I think a lot of flight attendants see is that, wait a minute, none of these 
hero crew members, I don't care if you're talking about the passenger or the pilots or the flight attendants, none of them followed the hijack protocol. So they really weren't heroes to us. <laughs> they might have been heroes to the CIA <laughs> because they made it look like the planes were hijacked. But what I was going to say is that those people had, uh, because they were trying to get on, and when you do this, when you're pass writing, you need to have an empty seat. It's important that you're going to try to get on a plane with an empty seat. So when you pull this up on a computer the night before, let's say you come in off a trip and you lay, you're laying over or staying at home and you live in Boston, you would go into a computer, a company computer, pull up the reservation list, and look and see, oh my gosh, there's only, you know, 86 people or 90 people on board. So I can get on that easy. So you get to the airport in the morning and they deny you boarding. Well, you've got the, you can print up another uh, spill or passenger list manifest um, and look at that and go, well, well wait, wait a minute now. How come I'm being denied boarding? Well, none of the real reasons you would be denied boarding fit. So obviously someone somewhere, somehow along the line, put out a message to not allow passenger, uh, passengers deadheading to be flight attendants off duty. Now on um, American 77, there was a couple uh, pass riders, but they were retired uh, pilot. I was a retired pilot and I think his wife but, and there was also somebody from an offline airline, somebody that was, I can't recall, I don't think it was a flight attendant, but a, some employee of Qantas Airline was on one of them, but not flight attendants. And so there are people that still have those printed out passenger manifests with no Arab names on them whatsoever. Now, okay, let's talk about that for a second. If you were the ringleader, Ramjet, if you were the ringleader, would you even go to Portland, Maine, drive up to Portland, Maine, or fly up to Portland, Maine to turn around and have a very short connection, so short that your luggage didn't get transferred, if you were going to pull off, if you were the mastermind of the biggest hijacked terrorist attack the United States of America had ever seen, why would you not just originate there like the crew did. If I was that guy, if I was Muhammad Atta, I would be sleeping in the nearest hotel to the airport. <laughs> and I would be at the airport way early. I wouldn't want to make sure that everything, all my ducks were in a row and that there were no mishaps, that I got on the plane and I was able to do what it is that the government has claimed I did. I'd exactly. want to make sure I was able to do that. There's no way in the world I would be in Portland, Maine or Portland, Oregon or Portland anywhere. I would be in Boston <laughs> and, that's and Boston I, only. And that's where I should have started from. And any logical thinking person would do this. But when you go back and you compare uh, other events that the CIA has been involved in, like the Kennedy assassination, there's very similar crazy stuff that doesn't work in the field of logic. So uh, let, let's continue talking about that. After my first book came out, Methodical Illusion, um, I was contacted by some American flight attendants that told me that Mohammed Atta was actually not just a frequent flyer, but he was a million mile passenger on Americans. So that's the top of the list, man. That's somebody that's flying more than we do. That's somebody that's in an airplane a lot. So if he's flying, let's just say in and out of Los Angeles or Boston in this case, uh, the flight attendants all would know him. So if he gets on board, that he's somebody that the flight attendants would call sir? Yeah, well, we try to do that all the time. But um, we would know who he was. We would know his name. It would be marked on the passenger manifest with his, along with his million mile mileage number. Um, and we would know what he likes to eat, what he likes to drink. Um, if he likes to sleep on a transcontinental flight, uh, if he, you know, takes a sleeping medication, you just know your passengers cause they're there a lot, a lot. And so all of the American flight attendants that were senior that would normally worked up in first class or business knew his name and they knew his name because he was a million mile customer. But here's a key factor about 9-11, putting that together with their official story. If Mohammed Atta came from Portland, Oregon, I mean, Portland, Maine, 
and he had a short 20 or 30 minute connection to get from uh, A to B and his luggage was tagged, which it would be, as an American Airlines million mile customer, it's a special tag and everybody on the ground knows it. That luggage tag says, put this luggage on that flight no matter what, if you've shut down the cargo bin, run it up those stairs in the jetway and give it to the flight attendants who will find a place for it. It's a priority. Let me give you an idea of what it would take to be a million mile passenger. That would mean that you would fly 150 round trips from Boston to Los Angeles in a year. That means you'd be flying basically <laughs> every other day. Well, I actually don't forth. think that the million mile club it's actually was a million miles. I think they brought it down to maybe 150,000 or something like that. That's what most companies did and they all all varied. It wasn't actually a million. I think they just called it that. But yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's a lot. I don't think they actually had to fly a million, but uh, they might have had to fly 250,000 or 500,000. I don't know. Uh, I don't even know that anybody knows. I, I might be able to find it actually online, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that he had a luggage tag that said to everybody working the ground, get this thing on that plane. There were two pieces of luggage that they, I've read. There were two that he had. and But you see, to make the story work, the CIA, Mossad, the planners, they had to have in there things that didn't make any sense. Okay, first off, what do you pack when you're going to crash your airplane into a building and suicide yourself? What do you pack? Why would you need a suitcase? You would. Your toiletry bag? <laughs> you brush your teeth before you meet Allah? I don't know. I mean, think about this now. If, if, if Muhammad, he wasn't on the plane, by the way, if he was on the plane, if he was going to intend to fly this plane into the Twin Towers, why would he have two suitcases with him? Why would he need a manual of how to fly a 767? Well, he's, he's going to hijack the plane and fly it into the building, right? Why would he need a manual down in the belly? Why would he have his uh, will and testament in his suitcase with him? Why wouldn't he have left that on the ground if he knew he was going to destroy that airplane why would you have a paper will and testament and isn't it weird that of all the things that disappeared from flight 11 the only thing that survived i believe it was originally claimed to be his paper passport from egypt well i would have those things in a in place if i was working with the cia where the cia could find them and broadcast right that information exactly. as soon as possible like right. maybe by nine o'clock yeah exactly there you go it was all staged for you because in real life he really was a million mile customer he was a vip to american airlines which means that american and everybody else would have i mean would have looked at that luggage tag and said nope it's going on board and trust me i have had this happen to me where you know people million mile guys say maybe they're coming in from some other city they're running late they're literally oj simpson running through the terminal and the agent comes on with their suitcase and says, you got to put this somewhere for him. Or, you know, he comes on with it. And you do find a place in, and we have closets and places where we stow crew luggage, even if it had to go into the cockpit and stowed, stored there where they store their luggage, uh, it would be put on inside the cabin. So that that didn't happen knowing this. And see, I, this is not something that, that was ever made public. It's one of those things that I just got, you know, contacted by so many people that had flown with somebody named Mohammed Atta uh, over the years because he was a million mile customer. And so kind of fascinating how if you understand that a million mile customer is recognized and known by the crew, by the ticket agents and has a special tag on his baggage, it's impossible to believe the official story that Mohammed Atta was the ringleader and that his luggage was not put on the plane. But just look at the stuff they told us was in his luggage. It's really a strange story. But what's even stranger to that, to me, is that initially in those first 72 hours, the FBI released the names of 19 Muslims that they claimed were 
the terrorist hijackers on board. But we have two flight attendants that were on the phone for nearly a half an hour. Neither one of them said there was more than one hijacker and they referred to him as a he. So how does that work? Now, one of the things that it's extremely important if there's a hijacking, you're, we would normally relay our information to the captain uh, because we're the pilot's eyes and ears, right? We would normally be giving distinct details and it, make sure that they were correct. You would never label the, the Israeli assassin in 9B as the terrorist unless you knew he was or the hijacker unless you knew he was you won't make a mistake like that it's extremely vital because in the situation of a hijacking the name of the game is to get the plane on the ground where the SWAT team or anti-terrorist team or Navy SEALs or whoever is nearby can get called in to come and help um can come in and if you've told them that 9B is the hijacker, that guy's going to get targeted. And you could, if you made a mistake like that, you could accidentally get somebody killed. And at this time, they assumed that this was a hijacking, then they were going to go through the procedures that they weren't following, but get the plane on the ground. So that's just something, again, that wouldn't happen. So there's two things on that flight right there that wouldn't happen. And then here's another thing that's really weird. Amy Sweeney, um, and she'd been flying about a dozen years, uh, like like uh, Betty Ong. Yeah, give or take. I, I just don't recall the exact n number, but plenty long enough to know the protocols like the back of your hand. But she said something that was really interesting. Near the final moments, she told her supervisor that none of the passengers in coach had any idea that anything was going on. Abnormal. Well, how could that be when they weren't being served breakfast? Of course they would be. They'd be back in the back galley looking for coffee or juice or a cocktail. I mean, I know because I lived this life, right? So now they take off at 8 o'clock. They hit the building supposedly at 8.46, but we know they'd landed. So for 45 minutes, you're sitting on an airplane and the flight attendants are sitting in their jump seat or she's in the uh, second to the last row in coach. And aren't you as a passenger going, where's my coffee? Where's uh, whatever we're going to get served? Where's my green eggs and spam? <laughs> where's my brekkie? I mean, really, the fact that nobody knew what was going on, well, they must have known something was going on because they weren't being served the meal that they would have been served. Now, just so you know this, on a transcontinental flight like that, leaving at 8 o'clock in the morning, customarily, we know, just like us, we get up at 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning and drive for an hour, get through security, go park our cars, all that stuff that you guys do too, and then check in, meet our crew, bid for a position, walk to the airplane. Well, we realize that you guys have done the same thing. So the first thing we do is, is get the food out as soon as possible. So in a normal flight, uh, once we reach cruising altitude about 20 minutes into this, we'd be rolling out with coffee, juice, and breakfast. That's what would have normally happened. And so anybody that normally would fly a transcontinental would know that was normal. How could passengers and coach not know this was something was going on? Another thing that was really weird is that Betty Ong said that um, they were paging for a doctor or a nurse because somebody had been stabbed in, up in business or a first class up front. And then Amy Sweeney said there was a doctor and a nurse that were tending to somebody that had been injured up front. Which is it? You know, the truth is only one thing, Betty and Amy. Which one is it? <laughs> They're telling two different stories. So another thing that was really weird about that is Amy Sweeney said to her supervisor that Betty Ong was sit sitting with her in the second to the last row of coach on an airphone, um, that she was sitting next door to her. But Betty Ong said several times in that first four and a half minutes that were taped, several times she said she was sitting in her jump seat at three right. So which is it? So... You have to understand how important it is that when you're relaying information in a hijack situation, that the information is accurate, correct, and this, it's in sync with the other information that other flight attendants would be giving. How could it possibly be that these women were sitting, you know, maybe 12 feet away from each other and they didn't have the same story? How is that? 
How could it be? It's impossible from a flight attendant's viewpoint. So for those of you that are still flying or did fly, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it, it is or it isn't. It's one thing or the other. And it's extremely important. This is one of the things that gets drilled into us. If we're looking at something, let's just say it's the number two engine on fire. And we call up to the cockpit and tell them the number number two engine's on fire and somebody else calls them with conflicting information and number one engine's on fire and there's only two engines. The pilots are going to go, what the heck? So it's vitally important that you're in the same reality. And these flight attendants on flight 11 obviously were not. They were not in the same room even maybe. <laughs> there's another thing that's really weird about them. So I'm, since I'm talking about it, I'm just going to let it roll. Uh, Amy Sweeney and Betty Ong both had been flying roughly 12 years. Um, when, if you consider the, the uh, situation that um, we saw of, on the Naudette brothers, something corkscrewing into the North Tower at a very rapid speed. You can't see what it is. It's a, a 767 is a big airplane. You would be able to focus on it because it can't fly 700 miles an hour that close to the sea level. So we know that's not not what it was, but the official story, we'll just kind of keep to that. So coming in normally uh, without the airplane falling apart at that level, they could have been at about 250 knots. You'd have easily been able to see this plane floating in, right? So, and neither one of the flight attendants said, oh my God, we're coming out like a rocket or we're, you know, like screaming. There was none of that because remember the coach passengers didn't even know there was anything going on. So that rapid descent they would have had to have been in. They didn't even know they were in a rapid descent. And that's why they weren't getting breakfast. They didn't know anything was wrong. Anything out of the ordinary was happening. So Amy Sweeney, she's looking out the window. They said, well, you know, where are you? What's your location? Can you tell where you're at? I see, I see, I, she says, I see buildings. I see water. Oh my God, I see buildings. I see water. And listen, let me tell you this. As a junior flight attendant, you fly into New York, into Manhattan at broad daylight at nine in the morning, eight in the morning, you know where you're at. You would say, I'm, <laughs> I'm home for New York. I see the Manhattan skyline. She didn't know where she was supposed to be. I guess somebody didn't tell her the rest of that story because she obviously didn't know where the plane was supposed to be. So maybe they didn't tell her it was supposed to be flown into the World Trade Center. So she just sprung with, I see water, I see buildings. Well, let me just say this. Landing in San Francisco, you see water, you see buildings. Landing in Los Angeles, you see water, you see buildings. That said nothing. But she surely knew where she was. If she was there, anybody would. So she didn't. So that told me, that really, she wasn't there where they claimed they were. Because in order for that plane to come out of the sky, and what we see in the Naudet film, and you only see it for a few seconds, first off, again, a 767 is a huge aircraft. It's very much similar to a DC-10 in the body size and stuff. I mean, it's a big airplane. It cannot fly even 500 miles an hour at 1,000 foot above sea level or 700 feet above sea level. And we see it coming straight out just like a missile. It's leaving one contrail that's a corkscrew. And so it looks like a little cloud contrail that if you slow the video down, you can see it going like a corkscrew. That's how a missile goes. Each engine on an airplane, if you can Google search this, you guys, and just go uh, wing vortex and go into the images on your uh, computer. Just a jet wing vortex. You'll see some fighter jets and you'll see some uh, 757s and stuff like that. Actually, the two engine ones form something that looks very much like a heart. So we know that wasn't a 767. We know that because we can look at it and we know that that, that we know this for a fact. You can even go to Boeing and, and ask them, <laughs> how fast could a 767 fly at 700 feet above sea level? <laughs> They'll tell you. Um, but it's interesting that that airplane, according to the data that's in the uh, Freedom of Information Act data, that the airplane was doing things that the people in the side weren't uh, in conjunction with. You know what I'm saying? If it's coming from uh, 35,000 feet, 29,000 feet, let's just say 30,000 feet, uh, if it's coming from 30,000 feet and it's going to go into a building, you know, 1,000 feet off, off the ground, 
they're going to have to have a descent somehow, somewhere. And for, for uh, millions of people in New York to have never seen an airplane come in, when you see them, if you go to the airport, you could see how these planes come in. That's how they have to come in. They can't come in f faster than they're not fighter jets. Even watching fighter jets land, <laughs> they're going to slow down because they're going to, they're going to land. They're not, they just can't do that at a thousand foot elevation because the air is too heavy. So they're going to slow down. As a matter of fact, even on the, uh, what the uh, air traffic controllers thought they were looking at, a blip on radar was showing about 200 to 250 knots. So, you know, 250 miles an hour at the max. You could easily focus on that big airplane coming in at that speed, but that's not what happens. And none of this meshes. And I think that, you know, quite frankly, I think that nobody thought that any flight attendant would have the brains and the stick to itness to really look at this the way I did. And I, looking back now, four books pushing into five and a nonfiction, looking back at that, now I understand why my first two novels were such a threat to the quote unquote 9 11 truth community and some people that have just been going crazy for four years making insane <laughs> videos and crazy stories about me or who I was or where I lived or whatever, trying to pick apart the details in the novel that have nothing to do with me. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think I would just, would I be that dumb? If I'm smart enough to figure out how 9 11 happened, I'd be smart enough to keep myself safe, right? I've done a pretty good job of that so far, but it dawned on me that when they started saying that I never flew, even recently, somebody asked me, how come there's not a picture of you in your uniform? Well, if you were a plumber <laughs> or a plumber, I mean, when you're a flight attendant, this is not some glamorous thing when you've been doing this for decades. Um, you don't really love your uniform. As a matter of fact, most of us put our uniforms in the mud room and hang it out. Pilots will do the same thing. Hang it in a separate closet because they stink like airplanes or they just, you know, take it right away, throw it in a garbage bag and take it to the dry cleaners. Um, it's not, it, an airline uniform when you're in the airline is just not that big of a deal. I could probably look and see, I may have some somewhere, but I, I don't, uh, I just don't recall ever. I have pictures of me on a camel <laughs> somewhere in China, but, um, I don't, I, I just don't recall ever having a picture done in my uniform. Cause it just wasn't something we did. I, it's, just, it's just, if you're a plumber, do you have a picture of you in your plumber suit? I mean, it's like, that's how we would look at it. Uh, so, but, but why, why they were doing that was to discredit me and discredit my career and discredit what I'm unfolding to you guys in the novels and what I will unfold in the nonfiction because I've got their data now. I'm not, not just my experience. I've got a whole team full of people with experience. And so the whole, th and the whole thing just kind of fell apart, but that must be why I was attacked, uh, for being, for, for really not being a flight attendant. I was really a chemist or a hooker or something. God, I want to, I don't know. There's at least 30. A nudist Buddhist. A nudist Buddhist. At least 30 uh, different people I'm supposed to be, maybe 40 now. And, and even Betty Young. And I'm, yeah, somebody even thinks I'm Betty Young. I am not Betty Young. Betty Young was Asian. Uh, so yeah, it's really weird, but I, you know, and I look back now and I go, what's that all about? You were sitting there writing books and pretending you want to know about 9-11 and you haven't had the balls to contact me to get the FOIA data or, Hey, how about talk to somebody that's in the airline? Uh, and then one of the things I also found out is that almost every person that's out writing books, uh, especially these co college professors that are retired that don't know how anything about anything. Uh, I don't, I question what they were even teaching now that I see how uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortex <laughs> had got her a degree in economics and the, some of the crazy stuff she says, I wonder about all college professors at this point. But the fact that they claim that the flight attendants were kidnapped and voice morphed and um, just nonsensical stuff, no planes operated, the planes operated, there were daily scheduled operations because you didn't know what the BTS was, it doesn't mean that the plane didn't take off. It did, and it did land somewhere, and we have eyewitnesses of that now. So it's interesting to me that people, and I'm including every 9-11 group in this, 
architects and engineers, pilots, lawyers, dog catchers, celebrities. Nobody is interested to talk to a person who has all of the government data and an entire team of aviation specialists and others. Yeah, they're afraid of the truth, I guess, aren't they? Well, that's pretty obvious to me, but that must be why my airline career became such a threat to these truthers, truthers, they call themselves truthers. Well, it wouldn't have been a threat if they th thought you were Grace. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it's all, all I want is a diamond <laughs> bracelet. Yeah, if I was Grace Lewis, that's true. But interesting coincidence, I didn't really realize this when I chose, you know, when, you, when you're riding... You know, I just just pull a name out of a hat. You know, I just I have a book of baby names, but I haven't resorted to it yet. But um, when I picked Grace's name, it just just came to me. I don't know, nothing. There was no hidden meaning or anything. But coincidentally, when Daniel Lewin, who was the passenger in Nine B, uh, moved from Denver to Israel, they changed their family name to Lewis. Interestingly enough, there were two, there were two other people by the last name of Lewis on Flight Seventy Seven. Kind of a just an interesting coinky dink, as Max Hager would say. So that's enough for today. All right, I think this is part four, the Christmas vacation into nine eleven. Deeper and deeper we go. Um, in lieu of our daily show, I have my swimming suit on and fins. <laughs> You're going deep. All right. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to also just touch on, because a lot of people ask me about this, um, and a lot of people really quite wonder who killed Grace. Well, it doesn't really matter because the reason that is in there, first off, I wanted people to really understand how even though uh, Vera Hansen and Grace uh, Lewis were very different in their personal lives. Once they put on their uniforms, they worked together and they were part of a family. And so, you know, she might be the kind of a gal that you probably wouldn't invite into your wedding, maybe even, but, um, but you liked flying with her because some people are just characters and they're fun to fly with and you're, they're fun to see what they wear and, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, some people, uh, just have a reputation, which kind of Grace did of just being out there in the glitz, in the bling, so to speak. But what I, one of the reasons why I wanted that to be in there, one, to throw you off uh, to these Middle Eastern guys who we end up later on finding out they really were not really working for a Middle Eastern boogeyman, except they were re working for an Israeli. Now, I've heard you say that, you know, you can come to a, an airline job and, you know, you've got a flight that you're scheduled on and you may meet members of the crew that you've never, ever met before. But you also see members of crew that you see on a regular basis? Yes. Okay. So somebody like uh, Vera and Grace, uh, you know, they're friends. So they schedule the same kinds of flights on, on a regular well, basis? Or I how think, does that work? I think in the, that relationship, if I remember correctly, they hadn't seen each other for quite some time. And so oftentimes when you fly with someone, maybe you'll go out to dinner with them or maybe with a group. And, you know, if you're on a one-on-one -on -one with somebody that you're just getting to know, they tell you their story. They're about to talk about their husband or their dog or their boyfriend or their birds. And, you know, I flew with somebody that raised birds and had litches of little tiny babies baby birds just coming out of eggs and that was their their fur baby lots of uh, flight attendants will have uh, puppies and uh, not ever have had children or maybe never been married and they have birthday parties for their pets you know there's so there's all kinds of people uh, all kinds of people out there flying around <clears throat> but uh, I think Grace and, and um, Vera had not seen each other for quite some time and uh, you know Grace kind of had this almost a motherly draw to Vera. She liked her. She wanted her to fly Paris so she could meet this Middle Eastern boyfriend. And it was because of that Middle Eastern boyfriend that I discovered the hijackers were still alive in real life. Um, so <clears throat> then, you know, because Vera had enough seniority, she could fly that Paris trip and have that layover a couple times uh, and, and do that with her. So Maybe Grace couldn't 
fly Asia all the time and hadn't hadn't been flying Asia. So she's always she was kind of new to all of that stuff. Where do you go have dinner? And what's where's the crew lounge? What goes on here? Uh, and that stuff. But that was more closer to what Vera flew more often. Uh, so she was kind of guiding her around. So she's like, yeah, I really want you to fly Paris with me. So the reason I put in that murder <clears throat> was so that you as a passenger, if you, this ever happens to you, you will understand that sometimes things happen on our layovers. Sometimes a crew member has a heart attack, a stroke, a, a brain aneurysm, or an aortic aneurysm, dies suddenly in bed, in the swimming pool, walking along the road. Um, I mean, we've had, I, over my career, we've had several people that were killed in car accidents, uh, and maybe riding in a cab or stepping out in front of a bus, not realizing that the traffic is traveling on the other side of the street from what we're used to, uh, stuff like that. Uh, aneurysms or heart attacks uh, just don't show up for pickup. And that's kind of what happened when Grace was murdered. And what happened then is because she was there and she was dead, um, you know, she, uh, Vero being the in charge person she was the purser so she worked right with the captain and this is how that whole family unity thing comes in and the captain comes up and you know we've we're on a time schedule now the pickup where the bus is going to take us to the airport you don't have time to mess around you got about a five to ten minute span to be able to make it to the airport in time so when she goes up because grace hasn't come down yet for pickup uh and then she calls for the captain to come up he tells her, I'll take care of crew scheduling. I'll, you know, give, give them the information. You stay here because now this is a murder. So the police want to talk to her. She found the body. So now this plane is going out two crew members short. So if you ever get on and you like things aren't working right, it seems like you're waiting forever for your peanuts. Or I know they don't serve meals very often now, but on international flights they do. If things aren't going right, it may be because something happened to somebody or some bodies. In this case, they went out two crew members short. And so that really affects how you get, how fast you get your uh, cocktails or your wine or peanuts or, or whatever we're serving. And so, uh, and then of course, you know, for Vera, it just kind of worked out because that, that was kind of how she was connecting then with Joel Sherman because she was very frustrated. And then she didn't know who the man in black was. So I just kind of wanted to work all of that in. But for the uh, subliminal meaning, <laughs> the subliminal reason I did that was that you would understand as a passenger, if you ever get on a plane and things just aren't going right, they seem like there's not enough help on board. Sometimes there's just not enough help. And so, and it may be because of something like that. It's not uncommon. Trust me. I mean, I, I can I think about it. I haven't really counted it out, but I, I can just say that it is not uncommon. Another thing that's not uncommon is something I saw the other day that happened with Donald Trump's, I think it was his 757. He has more than one plane, but I think it was the 757 that he flew around in the campaign. Uh, they were in where a lot of private planes are um, parked. And uh, somebody uh, parking, I don't know, a Learjet or 727 or something, and they tapped wingtips. And that is not an uncommon crisis either. I mean, it, it will definitely cause some damage, uh, and you're not going to go anywhere right away. But it's, it's very common in a crowded uh, jetway area, taxiway, when you're pulling into a parking spot or somebody's pulling out, that that, that can happen. Well, if a plane that's going to fly international, don't they have to have a minimum number of crew, uh, flight attendants? Uh, every airplane has a minimum number of crew members by the FAA. So if you don't have that, then the airline is responsible for finding exactly. uh, reserve people to come. And that may also be why planes are delayed on occasion, I guess. That's right. So if uh, they were part of a minimum crew, let's say there was a crew of seven is the basic FAA minimum. For the aircraft that Vera and Grace were on and they only had seven and they were five short they couldn't take off until they, they were replaced now to get a replacement they would go through um, crew scheduling there in in Paris would go through and the, through the list in the hotel and find reservists that were there on reserve and uh, if they were had had their legal rest had come in from another city what have you from maybe a different base they would call them up and give them as short as notice as possible can and it basically would tell them we need we're sending a cab it's at the hotel as soon as you can get in it 
uh, and there'll be one other person with you, uh, you'll be at the airport and we'll take off as fast as uh, you can do. And so instead of giving you a one hour notice to get dressed, you would get dressed as quickly as you could and maybe put yourself together in 20 minutes or so and get down to that cab because of a crisis like that happening and the airplane can't take off without an FAA minimum. Now, how did the FAA minimums happen? Every time a new airplane comes out of Airbus or Boeing, uh, the FAA has a, um, a facility, uh, I believe it's in Oklahoma City, uh, where uh, they will uh, do, a, they'll get people to fill the plane uh, these are just volunteers that come and do this. <clears throat> they know they're going to do this. They know they're going to be testing and they'll get uh, the crew members, just uh, random flight attendants uh, to sit in the jump seats <clears throat> and they'll do a mock evacuation of that airplane. And they will uh, <clears throat> do several of them to see how long, like I, I believe the evacuation for a 747-400 was 90 seconds. And, and, and it, that would be with, with your minimum crew. So they would put a minimum crew on there and then s kind of see, and then give them a ballpark idea how you want to get out of those planes as fast as possible. Because if there's a <clears throat> fire and stuff, that everything inside the plane is plastic and toxic, and it puts out a bl very thick black smoke. So that's what they do, though, to get people down those chutes. So they actually will uh, drill as part of the certification of a new aircraft and then the FAA will say okay well we need to have this uh, time frame met and we need to have this many people off the airplane in this period of time and we can do that with X number of flight attendants that's your FAA minimum means the plane can't take off with uh, less than that on board so usually uh, most airlines say you know have that a uh, buffer so there's one or two more than that not always Sometimes you, you have just the bare minimum. And if something happens to somebody, then somebody gets pulled in the middle of their layover and say, you know, it's an emergency, you gotta go. We need you to fly to Boston or whatever. So anyway, that, that was kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to really, you know, see how, and remember that Vera, that was the Christmas trip and, and she wanted to be done and have her dog out of the kennel and be decorating, be all finished with flying and stuff by the 20th. But because she got stuck there because of the police looking into this murder and all of the stuff that went on, uh, she barely made it home for Christmas. So, and if you, if you are a flight attendant and if you've ever flown, you know that it's really important to be home for Christmas. And so it's kind of fun when you get to a certain degree of seniority at your base where you can on, in December either have vacation like some people I know <laughs> that only have to fly one trip, um, uh, or you in December, uh, or you can either fly in the morning of Christmas or have either Christmas Eve off or or both. I mean, it's just a, these are milestones uh, in careers in the airline industry. So, a friend of mine whose son is a pilot is going to spend Christmas with his family because he is either on reserve or uh, flying somewhere because he's too junior to hold the day off or both days off. So, uh, but that's just how it works in the airline. So I, I kind of wanted to put that all in there. And really, I when I first wrote this book, I thought you know, a handful of flight attendants would read it. And so there's a lot of stuff in there that's kind of special for us in that industry, you know, like having Christmas off and getting home for Christmas, like Vera finally did. But, um, and in, at the same time, and I didn't plan this at, uh, at much far in advance, sometimes when you write just things just sort of happen, but it allowed her to get that relationship going uh, with Stan the man, you know, uh, Joel Sherman. And, you know, she was kind of stuck there. And, and here's another thing you can say to someone, oh, I'm stuck in Paris or I'm stuck in Tokyo. And people on the ground that don't do this all the time, they'll go, stuck? <laughs> like he did. You're stuck in Paris? <laughs> go have a glass of wine and some cheese, man. <laughs> I mean, it's like, well, things could be a lot worse. But to her, it wasn't. She's at work. Uh, I mean, it's it's just like when people say, oh, I don't know, I have a picture of me in my uniform. Well, I put it online. Well, first off, let me just remind you that I haven't flown for, what now, 14, 15 years. <laughs> so why? 
<laughs> Why would I go find, I'd have to scan it and all that jazz because we didn't have digital stuff back then. Let me ask you a personal question. Are you the same size now as you were when you stopped flying? No. So you wouldn't fit in the uniform anyway? No. But or they, it would they drown want, you. They want an old picture. They want to see an old picture. But I'd have to scan it into a digital something or other if I found one. But, I mean, why would I, why is that such a problem for people? I mean, I find that really interesting, especially when people, I know the guy from BBC the other day, he just wanted to discredit me. But um, why do people want to know where I live or I mean I do you do that to JK Rowling so I mean, she writes under four or five different names you want to know where all of her homes are and you know do people question she were you ever a mother did you ever go to a swimming pool and watch your kids swim and write this book or no that was the Twilight gal uh, who did that one um, but you know it's it's very odd to me uh, because those are people who are not interested in 9-11 or what happened. Those are people that are just there to try to discredit me. And I knew once I found out that this guy was BBC, that he, that was his mission. I was like, okay, well, this book, these books are not about me, by the way. Uh, I'm not Vera. Uh, she's just a, a combination of a whole bunch of people. And I chose Grace to be uh, the other end of the spectrum in a sense, where she was younger, she was into the money, she was into the thrill of being in Paris and having uh, champagne and rose petals and, you know, the fancy clothing and not all flight attendants are into them. A lot of flight attendants bring a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and a jacket and that's what they go out to dinner in. They don't go out and have champagne. Uh, but some people are like Grace, so you got to gotta have a little Grace in there. Um, so anyway, that's why, kind of why I did all that. But I, I really wanted to bring people into that world for two reasons. One, so you know that we're not stereotypical at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I flew with flight attendants that were lawyers <laughs> on their days off. Uh, so, you know, some of our fighter, fire, firefighters are work on an ambulance, and those are always people you want to fly with. Uh, because if there's a medical emergency on board, uh, well, you know, it's just, you, it's really nice to have people that really know that stuff really well. Um, you know, you can't really use a scrapbooker. <laughs> if you've got somebody in a heart attack, right? Oh, I'm a scrapbooking mom. <laughs> well, they're there, there too, but you know, they can go back and continue serving the meal. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just a real uh, diverse uh, group. And it is, I think, partly because of the way we work. And here's another thing I think a lot of people don't understand. Originally, now this is when I was working, I think that it's changed now. But we had a maximum of 80 hours a month. And you guys are sitting there thinking, 80 hours? Well, I work 40, 60 hours a week. But you don't understand how the time works. This is time inside a jet from pushback to, to a gate in. Um, it's flying time. That doesn't include all the time on the ground, boarding and deplaning people and going through customs and, you know, checking in and bidding for your trips and all of this others driving to the airport, overnighting in foreign cities, you know, so really it works out that um, it takes about, I guess, domestically, probably 13, 14 days away from home, away from your own bed to complete that many hours. And then internationally, you can do it in, in nine days or so, depending upon you know, the length of your trip, flight time of your trip, I should say. So obviously, the name of the game in the airline pretty much is, how many days off can I get in my own bed? <laughs> to put it rather shortly, how many days off, how can I get there? And it, sometimes you can get there sooner by, by commuting into a more junior base. So that's where that seniority thing, and that all changes if you go to a more junior base. Um, so I was at, in the top 10 in a base I was at for a while, and I was uh, way down the totem pole in another base. And I've been in about five different bases over my uh, career, and then I was in various different stages. So when you're senior, you can hold any trip you want, but when you're junior, it's a little tougher. You know, you're going to fly over every holiday. Um, it's, you're not going to fly the premium stuff, and you're probably going to fly about closer to 14 days a month. But when you get up there in junior and you're flying uh, international, uh, then you can, be, you can push it down to 9 or 10 days or so uh, easily. 
So that's kind of how that works. And so you see where it enables us to have another job and work two or three days, you know, you could sell real estate or you could be a nurse or you could be a dental assistant or I'm a gazillion teacher assistant and you could just work with your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays at that job and then fly Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that's how it works. And a lot of us do that. So, and you just never know which one you're going to get a Grace or you're going to get a Vera. <laughs> you just never know. So don't have that stereotype. I know one time uh, when my first book came out, somebody with one of those 911 stickers on that Facebook, what, what would you know? You're just a flight attendant that serves Coke and 7-Up. Yeah, well, I'd like to have a conversation with that jackass about right now. Because you know he hasn't read any of the books. Because they're still hiding over there at AE911 the truth. They don't want to know the truth. It's just like all the other 911 groups that have never asked to see the data. They don't care to know what did I find in, in North Vancouver. They don't want to know. They don't want to know the truth. They just want you to send them money to Patreon, buy their book, buy their poster, whatever. 911 was an inside job. Oh, really? Tell me about it. Um, so, yeah, and it's kind of fascinating. And, and that's a kind of an overall study. And I, I really uh, was a, I've always been a big fan of uh, psychology. That's why I'm really interested in this Q phenomena, because it's a cult. And I, it's always fascinating to me to see how people, groups of people, and that's why I'm watching social media make a meme that becomes somebody's reality and it can be completely false. And if people can make a YouTube's videos about me and my husband, they're completely false. Has nothing to do with me or my husband. Uh, and, but they've, they've got the right in America, they've got the freedom of speech to go out there and say anything they want. So do I. So I'm just not that kind of a jerk. So, and, and I mean, it's for me fascinating because writing novels, you would think it's no big deal, but you know, people don't want to, they don't want to admit that I flew. <laughs> okay. That's fine with me. You don't have to, but I, I'm assuming that these are people also that haven't read the books. And so, you know, oftentimes when I get email from people telling me something that's kind of already been in the books. I'm like, have you read my books? Because, and listen, if you haven't, I'm happy to send you a set, you know? Um, because, quite frankly, I think they should. Uh, I mean, and, and the reason I do think they should is because by reading the books, I think slowly you get to see. And, and looking back now over those last four or five years, when I wrote Methodical Illusion, I truly thought that they had used the flight termination remote control system that they had, that DARPA had perfected by the mid 80s at Edwards Air Force Base. I truly thought that <laughs> because all the pieces worked that way for me because uh, until I really realized that the planes had to be steered into the hangars by the person in the left seat uh, and started looking at, at a, a little different thing. And then of course the, the find up in North Vancouver, uh, it just kind of you know, changed the whole thing. But then I look back and I'm like, wow, there's a whole bunch of 9-11 truthers out there still today arguing which remote control was it? Was it the one Boeing hadn't patented yet? The QR, whatever it is, or the flight termination system? Well, there's no need to argue about that now, is there? But they are not going to stop. That's their deal. And it's a diversion away from the truth. That's all it is. And that's what I started to see then, came to me in the shower, actually that these groups and these people, they're just diverting you away from what really happened. But by now, people have been so brainwashed. It's really, really difficult, isn't it? To undo your head from all the anti-Muslim brainwashing you've had. Because Fox News really has hit it hard. I don't turn them on anymore. But uh, CNN pushes the black versus white hate and division. Uh, but Fox, no, they're into the anti-Muslim stuff. And when you realize there were no Muslims on board those four planes, and then you look and see what did we do by going to war in Afghanistan and Iraq, two countries that didn't even have fake hijackers <laughs> involved with this. Uh, and then you look around your town and your community and look at all of the heroin and the opioid problem. Where does that come from? 
Afghanistan. Do you remember, are you old enough to remember the Vietnam War and how those guys' bodies came back full of dope? Remember the Golden Triangle? Operation uh, Phoenix? Remember all of this stuff that started with Vietnam and we started to wake up? Now, this book I've recently been reading is really talks a lot in depth about how much of the drugs coming into this country is compliments of the Central Intelligence Agency. And this is how they finance their black operations and their false flag operations so you have to wonder i mean what would you do if somebody either threatened you with your life or your life of your kids or grandkids or parents either threatened you either you're going to play play a part in this game or we're going to kill your family members or we're going to set you up so you never have to work a day in your life you like boating We'll get you a yacht. Like big houses? It's yours. I mean, it's kind of reminds me of the Lion King, you know? <laughs> Where's Scarface or whatever the, the uncle was, you know? All of this can be yours. Because some people will do anything for two reasons. Their country, to be convinced that this is the right thing to do for America. And they'll do it anything for money. And so that's kind of one of the things I wanted to bring out. Uh, and that includes some crew members, as I'm sure some passengers as well, um, to play this part. Now, since I wasn't there, uh, I'm, I don't know how a lot of the details played out uh, about how, how certain people were convinced to play the part of of faked hijacking, but you don't have to go very far. And if you haven't already done this for your homework assignment today, you'll want to Google search Operation Northwoods and read every page of it. It's declassified now. And that's what our own government, yes, indeed, this came out of the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and everyone agreed to it except John F. Kennedy. Everyone was in agreement with terror attacks on American soil and faked hijackings of commercial planes. That's all there. So you can see, and it was done for this reason, to go to war with communist Cuba, Castro's Cuba. So when you switch that into what happened on 9-11, and where are we right now? We are 17 years nearly into war with Iraq and Afghanistan. And what has changed for America? What do we have? A huge opioid problem in every small town across this country. Why is that? Because these drugs are being brought in by the CIA. They're making money to, uh, to fund uh, whatever they're doing in Africa or the Middle East, uh, Yemen, uh, Kenya. There's stuff going on now. We've got special forces or CIA or Blackwater mercenary troops all over the world setting the stage for another coup of a government so that we can rape them for their rubber or for their dope uh, or something else that we want. Maybe it's bamboo for all I care, but it's usually uh, oil, natural gas, uh, gold, precious metals, and drugs. That's just the way it's been. That's the history. And that's why I really wanted to uh, bring that out in that fourth book, because every once in a while I run into somebody who just can't believe our government would do that to us. They killed all those innocent people. Well, they planned to do it in 1962. Why wouldn't they do it in 2001? Of course they would. And they'd do it today or they'll do it tomorrow. So, but, uh, you know, the more people we can wake up, and if they can wake up by reading novels and then eventually they pick up the nonfiction, then yahoo, they're awake and they're aware. And that's really, I, I think that's really why I did it. I think that's why, because somebody had to do it and it was a dirty job. And I'll take all of the sticks and stones. You can't break my bones. Uh, I'll take all the guff, all you fake truthers going to push out there and you pseudo sleuths on the internet that think I don't have bunions and I never walk the aisle. Some chick named uh, Sophia Smallmind, uh, she, she claimed that I was an Illuminati child, that I had my own airplane. Yeah, I never, <laughs> I never flew. 
And, and she did that because of the puzzle piece on methodical illusion and that a fact that I was in a pose that looked like Emma Illuminati. <laughs> oh my God, if she only knew. <laughs> Uh, the hours, I guess, you know, she wouldn't really relate to the Vietnamese turd floating down the aisle <laughs> on takeoff, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's weird. People on the internet are just weird. And uh, wow, I've had my share of weirdos attacking me for uh, up one side and down the other. But you know what? Life is going on. I'm working on book five, the nonfiction. It's going to be really good. It's going to be expensive, though. It's only going to come back out in hardback. Uh, but I was just looking at it today. I was thinking, wow, this thing's going to be big. It's going to cost a lot. It's going to cost a lot to do. And so it's going to cost a lot to, to produce, is what I mean. So there you go. Well, that's enough for today. I hope you're enjoying your Christmas holiday.